Hello and welcome to Psyched, the conference where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. Today we're joined by Stephen and Sam Mandel of Ketamine Clinics of Los Angeles. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to Psyched. Thanks for having us. Good to us. be here. I'd love for y'all to just start us off with uh, a little bit about the ketamine clinic that y'all have been operating, maybe a little bit of the background story and maybe some backgrounds on yourselves. I'm Stephen Mandel. I'm a physician. Uh, I had gone to graduate school in clinical psychology, loved it. I uh, went to medical school. Everybody said, well, he's going to be a psychiatrist. But I ended up going into anesthesiology. Well, one of the major anesthetics, it was approved by the FDA, for an anesthetic in humans in 1970 is ketamine. And I was using ketamine a lot for anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Now I was hearing ketamine being used for mood disorders. I couldn't believe it. I really could not believe it. I was doing great with anesthesia and I loved it. But man, when you do anesthesia, you're like, like a ferry boat captain. You're taking people across a journey and that journey is where a surgeon or some other interventionist intervenes I was running the anesthesia for a plastic surgery clinic. So I had use of the recovery room in the afternoon. So I started bringing people in and saying, hey, let me just try this, because I knew ketamine really well. But using ketamine this way is quite different than using it to put people to sleep. This is not putting them to sleep. So um, I started doing it, and I was just blown away. You know, if you went to medical school so you could make a difference, so you could help people. Uh, when somebody wakes up and says, oh my God, you gave me my life back. It's transformative. Um, extremely interesting uh, how you got into uh, ketamine as uh, treatment for mood disorders. Um, maybe uh, expands us a little bit about the point that you said on how it's different to basically provide anesthesiology and actually be able to provide it as a psychiatric treatment. Uh, are you playing the role of a therapist at the same time, or are you still basically doing uh, the same procedure as you, as you would as an anesthesiologist? Great question. Uh, quick answer, no, you're not providing anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Quick answer, no, you're not being the therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, you're providing a very measured amount uh, of medicine to produce a state in which the patient can have a transformative experience, A, and stimulate new growth in their brains, B. If for anesthesia, it's deep sedation, the patient's asleep, you know, as uh, Dr. Mendel says, you know, your job is well done if the patient doesn't ever even know you were there. Mm -hmm. uh, a little different with a, a sub-anesthetic dose of ketamine, which is typically a half a milligram per kilogram of body weight over about a 40-minute period. At Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles, we do a 55-minute infusion, and then we do a little bit more medicine over that period of time. Um, but people are conscious and awake the entire time, uh, and there's a sweet spot, you know, of the level of dissociation that they have, which is the kind of experiential component of the infusion, where a lot of that inner work can occur. And that's a lot of what people focus on when they talk about psychedelics. So with ketamine, there's the kind of neurochemical response in the brain that's happening, which is, is vast and there's a lot going on there uh, with neurotransmitters like glutamate. And then there's the experiential component. So it's kind of twofold as far as the therapeutic benefit. Um, but with the dissociation with ketamine, there's this kind of sweet spot. And that's where a little bit of the art meets the science as far as helping people to uh, disconnect from the default mode network, the chatter in their minds, that inner voice a little bit, and have this kind of separation from self but not go so far that you don't know who you are, what you are, or where you are. And that's a scale. Mm -hmm. So we help people to achieve that sweet spot and, uh, and to, to get relief from depression, PTSD, suicidal thinking. Mm -hmm. So let's rewind back for a second. So we'd love to hear a little bit about how this got started in uh, 2014 and maybe even a little bit of context on, you know, how was ketamine uh, legalized specifically for being able to treat mood disorders? It's important to clarify right now, ketamine is legal mm -hmm. for humans. Okay. It's not an animal tranquilizer. It is an animal tranquilizer. Right, yeah. But it was first approved by the FDA as an anesthetic in humans. Mm -hmm. When the FDA approves a drug for use in humans, any physician can give it for any indication he or she deems appropriate. Mm. If um, Rogaine is approved for blood pressure, 
And some guy realizes, my God, my patients are having hair grow. And he gives it for hair growth. It's perfectly legal because it's a legal drug given by a credentialed person. Similarly, ketamine is legal for anesthesia. And if a person who can give a drug for anesthesia says, I'm going to give this for mood instead, it's totally legal for them to do that. Mm -hmm. It's called an off-label use, yeah, and actually one in three psychiatric medications are prescribed off-label. So it's way more common than, than most people realize, and almost one in four of all prescription medications are prescribed off-label. So ketamine, you know, was approved as an anesthetic, and when a medicine is approved by the FDA, it's for a very specific indication and a specific amount and frequency protocols around that and for a specific patient population. Any one of those variables being different then you know, makes it off-label. And ketamine is a cheap generic drug. The patent is up. You know, it was approved by the FDA in 1970. So no one wants to foot the bill of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to run additional trials per the FDA standards to get it approved specifically as an antidepressant because they could never recoup those costs, which is why Janssen Pharmaceuticals got Spravato, or also known as S-ketamine approved, because it was a very specific, uh, the S-isomer, and it was nasal, and there's all these other protocols around it so that they could package it and say, okay, well, this is different enough. Now this is ours, and we can own it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So we have now, uh, you know, nasal ketamine, essentially, that is FDA approved. And so in 2014, when y'all kind of joined forces to be able to build this, what were some of the conversations? Well, they're very different then. Mm -hmm. This was very, very fringy, very peripheral. Ketamine was used for anesthesia, and it was basically a party drug as well as an anesthetic. I was doing this in this clinic, and I'm getting great results, and I spoke to my psychiatry friends, and they said, that's nice, but we're not going to do anything. <laughs> this is crazy. We're not, we're not going near this. And But I started... It was so transformative for patients, and there was such a demand for it among those who have what's called treatment-resistant depression, which has a formal designation, but for our purposes, people have tried everything and nothing worked. There's a tremendous leap from giving an occasional patient an infusion for mood and running a practice based on it, mm -hmm. especially in the face of tremendous resistance from other physicians. Right. So I, I got this guy involved. I happen to know him for a long time <laughs> and in a lot of different contexts. And um, he was between gigs. He was an actor at the time, pretty good actor. Also, I was getting busier and busier. And my plastic surgeon was saying, hey, you know, you're an anesthesiologist. Let's, <laughs> let's get on with the anesthesia. And I was more and more having to get substitutes to come in and do the anesthesia so I could do the ketamine, which I must acknowledge was a lot more fun. Um, so we sublet space from him in that same suite so that we could start our clinic, and that's how we started. I, um, I first had my kind of more formal exposure to mental health when I was 13. I volunteered for a teen-to-teen -teen suicide prevention hotline called Teen Line, which is still in existence today. And I took calls from teens in crisis um, after school a couple days a week and made a big impact on me. And as I grew up, I had a lot of uh, friends and family who struggled with mental health. And unfortunately, I have uh, quite a few today and dealing with depression, uh, bipolar disorder, addiction, suicide and growing up around it. And of course, having my own challenges over the years as well, it was an area of interest. And I had a lot of odd jobs and all different kinds of industries trying to you know, support myself while pursuing the arts. And as I started to look into this, and as Dr. Mandel told me about it, um, all of the clinical research was positive. There was almost no negative outcomes at all. And, and way more effective than what we have available today with conventional medications. Yet the general consensus among the average person was A, they've never heard of it, and then B, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm around it, which I thought was kind of strange. And kind of the deeper down the rabbit hole we went, the more enthusiastic we became that this really could be the next solution to the mental health crisis, which is a personal issue for both of us and something we're passionate about. And we started in this plastic surgery office 
where, as, as Dr. Mendel said, we had this recovery room to use for, tr for treatment for patients, which was a small area, but the actual office that we worked in together was literally an eight by eight foot room. And we had started out with a folding table and folding chairs and two laptops and a desk phone. And that was like literally it. And it was just the two of us for a long time. And then we moved to uh, an office in Brentwood with 1,700 square feet of our own. And then we moved to Culver City with 3,600 square feet of our own where we are now. And now we're expanding that into 5,000. And we have a, a full-time staff of 13 and two part-time. So it's really grown and changed quite a bit over those years. And you know, we remember fondly uh, those, those early days. I feel like a lot of the times when uh, individuals meet great uh, healthcare practitioners, they you know begin to spread the word of mouth, which it sounds like a lot of your business has been generated from. Uh, is have any of your patients come back to you and said that you know, well, I talked to my family or my friends or some people, you know, they're really struggling with this, but as soon as they hear ketamine, you know, they're getting getting a bit scared off. Um, has that happened, or are patient testimonials strong enough where that that hasn't even really been a problem? It's such an important question because people make decisions based on the truth and they make decisions based on what they trust. A great model is the whole vaccination thing today. There's a great deal of information, but when you really peel away the layers, people decide whether or not to get vaccinated or not vaccinated, not based on their own study, but based on whom they trust, what authority they trust says. And that's true with ketamine as well. And when we started out, the preponderance was, oh my God, what are you talking about? Increasingly, um, people are saying, oh yeah, that works. And I'd love to tell you it's because of the hundreds of research articles and the thousands of hours that really talented people have put in demonstrating that this is really effective that this is really safe, that it works in an unbelievable percentage of the time, and it doesn't hurt folks. It's fast, and it's cheap. But the real reason is the pendulum of trust has swung in our way. And that's partly because people are smart. It's also partly because the opinion makers, when you see a cover of Time magazine, when you see something in Rolling Stone, when you see something in Vice, and then in New York Magazine, or somewhere in your chess club says, oh my God, my kid couldn't go to school. He was just laying in bed miserable. And now he's back in class, and I, you know, I got these treatments for him, and it worked. It's weird, I know, but it worked. Mm -hmm. The preponderance of the fact and the lived experience, plus the opinion maker's aura of okayness really isn't making the difference. Mm -hmm. It's been a long journey though. When we started, people literally said we were experimenting on people. Um, there's an enormous education gap even today, even within the medical community. I still even today have nurses and doctors who say this is totally irresponsible and what are we doing? And many who have never heard of it and either never heard of ketamine even or they've heard of it and they say, oh yeah, but you give that to people. And it's just amazing, you know, most people, will say it's a horse tranquilizer or a cat tranquilizer. Some know it as an anesthetic. Others know it as Special K, the, the club drug. And then very, very few know it as uh, the most effective, fastest acting antidepressant available today. And you know, you put all those people in the room and they're all gonna you know, raise their voices over who's right. And they're all right, right? I mean, ketamine has many different identities and, and applications that it works for. Um, but the research has, the body of research has grown. As Dr. Mandel said, the amount of press has grown and the stories that are truly inspirational, the number of people who have been able to access this treatment and then who are brave enough to share their experience has really moved the needle. And it's been amazing to be part of that. I mean, from the beginning, one of the things that we identified was really that need to help to raise awareness and to spread factual information about this. And that continues to be a challenge you know, today, which is why we're grateful to be talking with you and grateful for you and people who you know, take the time to really to, to have the conversation and to put it out there. Um, it's, it's really, really important. Could you all walk us through uh, what preparation and integration look like uh, at your clinic and before and after patients actually receive care? Yes, we, we do uh, extensive preparation of the patient uh, 
for the experience. But we tailor that to the individual. We have patients who are coming to us who've never had any psychedelic or any mind-altering substance and who are quite depressed and or suicidal. And we walk them through what they're likely to experience. The distinction that, that Sam made about root of administration is super important here because the nasal is um, like a rocket ship. It's really more dramatic in terms of rise time Delta, if you will, than IV. It's more than an IV push is a, is a, a nasal bump. Um, so we give IV, and we give it gradually over time. We don't give it a push. We give it in a, in a computer-controlled pump very gradually. So we prepare the patient that they're going to be altered and what to expect. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have, almost all of our patients have psychiatrists and most of them have psychotherapists. Mm -hmm. And we want them to have a relationship with a person whom they trust, who they can process the experience. We're going to probably talk about ketamine and ketamine and, and ketamine assisted psychotherapy and that whole thing. Um, the alteration that we're seeking to achieve for patients is usually more than permits them to articulate to another person at the time of the treatment. Mm -hmm. So we prepare them, but we don't attempt to do therapy and we don't advocate doing therapy at the time of the treatment. Right. We do advocate talking therapy in conjunction with it and closely following on and scheduled with the treatments. Mm -hmm but not at the same time, because it's different levels of alteration. So a dialogue with another human in a way that you can store and process requires a lower level of alteration than we seek to achieve in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Our whole uh, med team, and we have a, an entire team to provide like a one-to-one -one ratio of patients in the clinic to make sure they get adequate or more than adequate um, support and monitoring the entire time. And most of them have some training in psychology or therapy outside of the training that we give them as far as kind of the nuances of, of interacting with people who are undergoing an experience like this. And some of them have even had infusions because they have mental health challenges and they um, were good candidates for the treatment. So they have that first person uh, knowledge of what it feels like. And a lot of this is holding space for people in just a very caring and supportive way meeting them where they're at. People might laugh for an hour straight during an infusion. They might cry for an hour straight. Some people become frightened. Other people find bliss. There's so many different experiences, and it's not just person to person. It's infusion to infusion. So what you know, Marie experiences on day one is almost surely going to be very different from day two and then three and four and so on. And just providing a safe, comforting, and, and caring space for people is extremely therapeutic for them. Uh, we provide blankets, pillows, noise-canceling headphones with relaxing music and a sleep mask, and they recline, and, and we're monitoring their vitals the entire time, and we just help them to feel safe and, and comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, afterwards, we'll often chat with them a little bit about their experience, and when I say we, I mean, you know, the, cl the clinical team, the medical team will speak with them about their experience, but it's not therapy, mm -hmm. and people are not in a great mindset to engage in therapy at that moment. There's a lot to process about the experience that really does escape language. And people say that all the time, I wish I could have like recorded my thoughts, or I wish I could you know, see the images of what was in my mind like now to, to discuss them. Right. And giving people that space and time to rest and recover and process on their own can also be really therapeutic for them. And that's why we really encourage them to then share that with us at a later date. And not instead of, but in addition to working with a, uh, a therapist, psychologist, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in addition to that, uh, every new patient uh, has a, a phone interview with me that evening to just debrief and process and to identify early on if things are going sideways. Mm -hmm. They virtually never are. Mm -hmm. But if they are, it's so important that the caregiver be aware of that early on. 
Uh, as we look at the entire uh, psychedelics ecosystem and how much it's grown, not just since 2014, but even in the last two years, mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that are being talked about is the rollout of MDMA and psilocybin over the next 24 months. Um, is that something that y'all are watching, paying attention to, and perhaps even incorporating into the clinic that you currently operate? We're really, this is gonna sound bizarre, we're not ketamine people. We're relieving suffering people. We're behavioral health people. We're about depression and suicide and PTSD. Other things too, like eating disorders, like uh, substance use, alcohol use, opiate use disorders. The first time ketamine was used for behavior was in the 80s in, in Russia for alcoholics. And these were falling down drunk alcoholics. And they had a 52% success rate. That's a year of abstinence. Mm -hmm. That's, so that, let me tell you about ketamine for addiction. These were guys very addicted to alcohol, who mm -hmm. did super well. These are wonderful, possibly wonderful tools. Mm -hmm. They're brand new. We really know nothing about them. They're very promising. To the extent that they show efficacy, we want to use them. Particularly psilocybin seems to be very promising for end of life issues. Mm -hmm. Ketamine's good for that. Psilocybin may have some advantages. MDMA is great for people with, with intimacy problems and relationship issues. We want to incorporate all of that. Mm -hmm. We're looking even at other things too that we haven't talked about today, but like, um, like TMS. We want to be behavioral health. We are a ketamine clinic. We are the ketamine clinic. But we're not devoted to ketamine, we're devoted to relieving these afflictions. I would add, you know, one of the reasons why we've just specialized on ketamine for eight years now and really not included much else is because it has proven to be so much more effective, to work so much faster, to be so much safer than the alternatives. It's been hard to invest much time or energy into other things. And one of the things that we did from the beginning is to be full-time in ketamine. And that's something that set us apart then and that really does still set us apart today. As we wanna be able to offer other modalities to patients who either can't afford ketamine out of pocket costs, even though we offer interest-free financing, it's not feasible for everyone. Patients who may not benefit from ketamine, we have an 83% success rate, which is significant. Most of the literature is around 70%. We do a number of things a little differently and we get better results. Uh, but still, that leaves about 17% who don't benefit. So we'd like to be able to offer um, alternatives to them as well. So the idea of uh, things like TMS, uh, psilocybin, MDMA, very exciting. And we're very evidence-based at the end of the day. We want what demonstrates results, and we want to achieve results you know, with and for our patients. So anything that's evidence-based and that's innovative, progressive, that really works, you know, we're here for it. And those agents and other psychedelics seem extremely promising. Um, you know, there's definitely some key distinctions between them and ketamine that a lot of people don't get when they lump it all into the psychedelics category, like ketamine being an FDA approved anesthetic that's been around since the 60s and approved since 70, which it was one of the most widely used anesthetics in the world. And there is an enormous amount of safety and efficacy data on it that those substances will almost likely never catch up to just because of how its lead on them. And even ketamine infusions for depression, there's about 160, uh, 165 clinical trials that have been conducted. At least 65 of them with results published today available that you can look at now. Um, the rest either are currently underway or completed without results published, but there's a lot of data on ketamine and a lot of data on ketamine for mental health. Mm -hmm. um, these other agents, not so much. And most of what we have is anecdotal. They've been around, yes, you know, psilocybin for thousands of years. Um, but again, we need, we need to see some, some more actual data on them. I'm a doctor, I have a license. Mm -hmm. I can't be giving these agents, which we really are promising and which we really have no data on, mm -hmm. basically. Yep. I can't give those to people or I'll lose my license. Of course. Yeah. It's not an option. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about them and it would be totally off the wall irresponsible to hold out a shingle. Oh yeah, come get me your psilocybin therapy. Yeah, there are people doing that but they're not licensed people, and if they are, their license is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. It's all totally inappropriate. There is no good clinical data on either of them. That doesn't mean they aren't possibly the next great thing, 
But they're not here yet. Yeah. It always irks me when people, either patients suffering from mental health challenges or, or addiction, or even clinicians say, ooh, I can't wait for psilocybin, or I can't wait for MDMA, because then we'll finally have something that works better than conventional pills or whatever, fill in the blank. And I'm always scratching my head like, yeah, those are exciting for sure. Like, I'm, I'm on that train too, let's bring them out. But what about ketamine? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ketamine is here now, today. We've been doing it for eight years. What, are we chop liver? I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> clinical research, you know, goes back at least 20 years. The medicine itself, like I said, over 50 years. Why are we not more enthusiastic about ketamine now, today? And let's look to the future at what's next and talk about the next breakthroughs, but let's not forget about what is not even reached its kind of peak in awareness and in efficacy for the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also a lot of politics about companies looking to have patents and have ownership of these drugs. A lot of the information people get are from the, the parties that stand to benefit from them having that information and getting them excited about what's coming. And um, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nuance there, I'll just say. There isn't a big pharmaceutical company who wants to sell ketamine, except for Johnson & Johnson wanting to sell their branded, patented, their isomer. Mm -hmm. They took Vasima ketamine, right. two isomers. And they were able to convince the FDA to give them proprietary control of one. Mm -hmm. So they teach us the way all vendors teach us in a way that steers our wallets. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody behind ketamine. And the research firms and the venture capital firms trying to push psilocybin, want you to get excited about psilocybin. And there are things about it you should get excited about. But don't have any illusions about why you're hearing a lot about it in the press. The quality of information behind the administration of ketamine for mood disorders is impeccable. It's outstanding. And it's just, just there's enormous amounts of it. And well, let's, let's take a moment and talk about what impeccable means really quickly. I mean, we're talking about independent clinical research, you know, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover studies, you know, the height of gold Not standard. Not sponsored by pharmaceutical houses. Mm -hmm. The height of gold standard research and across prestigious universities and institutions all over the world, Harvard, USC, UCLA, um, Black you know, Dog the, Institute. A Black Dog Institute of Australia, the Cleveland Clinic. Oxford. Oxford, I mean, you know, you name it. Karolinska, I mean, everyone's the best done, places in the world. Mm -hmm. Everyone's done uh, a study on it, who's anyone in, in research. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's really significant, and that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize. When you get um, a study from the manufacturer of a new medicine who stands to profit from the sale of it, and they say, hey, this is great and here's why, you have to have that context, and it doesn't mean that it's not great. But you have to have that context. Ketamine is um, really ubiquitous. It's been, get, been given lots of different routes. For behavioral health, the optimum route is intravenous via a pump. Nothing else works as well. It can also be given by a shot IM. It can also be given by a kind of a dissolving tablet under the tongue. It can also be swallowed. Uh, it can even be put in other orifices. It can be put on the skin. They all have some efficacy. None of them work as well as the gradual administration intravenously via a pump. You're actually stimulating new growth in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's been proven. More receptors mm -hmm. per cubic centimeter. More dendrites. Mm -hmm. um, this is not fantasy or wish anymore. This is proven. Mm -hmm. That brain growth requires time at altitude. Mm -hmm. The only way to get time at altitude is with a continuous infusion. There's no question that other routes of administration are therapeutic. Um, it's just there's a lot of debate about what's the best or people saying that they're the same and there's not differences. And that's where we start to get a little bit antsy around that because it's just factually inaccurate uh, to say that there's uh, not a clear best or that uh, it's other than IV or that they're all the same and there's no difference. Um, 
they, they, the differences are significant. And also, I just want to add all the clinical research that we talked about earlier and all the leading institutions who have conducted it, it's been 90% plus IV. Um, it's almost been entirely IV infusions. That's what's been researched. So there's very little clinical data to support other routes. Again, not saying that they don't help people, mm -hmm. uh, but you know we have to call it what it is. Of course, yeah. So as we're wrapping up here, uh, one thing that I really want to uh, give us some room to discuss is what is the future of, of ketamine care? Right now we're using it to treat you know, depression um, and uh, other mood disorders. Can we be using it for family therapy, intimacy issues, um, and maybe even in, in communal contexts? Yes, yes, and yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just wild thing, in China they took 600 women who were delivering, they gave 300 of them I, I was delivering by C-section. They gave 300 uh, IM ketamine, a small dose, on the table as they were sewing them up after the cord was clamped so the new baby didn't get any. The mom got just a tiny bit. No therapy, no nothing, no interventions. And in the ensuing year, I don't know if you, I was totally blown away by the fact that suicide is the major cause of, of, of how new moms die. In the first year. In the first year. The suicide rate was half in the women who had the IM ketamine hmm. and nothing else. So there's a, we don't know the limits of this medicine. It's really so varied in its expression. Uh, we're just beginning to learn it and how to use it. And you know, we always think when we're doing something that's getting some good results, like we know stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know stuff compared to yesterday, but we don't know anything compared to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There was another study, uh, if I could add to that, um, aside from application for PPD, which is an area of interest for us, a um, bunch of, uh, this was animal models, but a bunch of mice, half given ketamine, the other half not prior to actually traumatizing, traumatizing them, exposing them to trauma. The mice who got the ketamine before being exposed to the trauma did not have nearly the instances of, or incidence of PTSD as the mice that did not have the ketamine. It was and prophylactic. I, prophylactic, and I, I apologize, I don't have the, the specific numbers, but it, statistically significant. And it's pretty incredible when you look at ketamine as a prophylactic for postpartum depression, PTSD, and other things, as well as a treatment for after these conditions are, are troubling people. Very, very interesting stuff. And I think that the future has in store ketamine for a wellness treatment and for personal discovery, growth, exploration. I think all of us have collectively experienced some degree of trauma with the COVID-19 pandemic over the last couple of years and anxiety and trauma in one way or another. And ketamine really can provide insight and self-understanding and self-forgiveness and compassion and growth in a way that is pretty amazing. And I hope in the future it'll be more accessible, not just for clinical indications, but for people who want to safely have that kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. Sam, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate everything you've taught us about uh, ketamine, psychedelic assisted therapy, and the incredible work that you guys are doing. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having us, pleasure. Thank you. To our audience, we'll see you next time on Psyched.